Okay, I'm going to announce that the meeting is being recorded. Auditorily and visually. Did we turn this on, actually? Yes, okay. Yep, you've been recorded the last minute. Also, all my rant about the party. No, that was... That was uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just that one. Probably. Like it's content for five. Okay, yeah. First on the agenda is public comment period, but our public has left for the moment. Um, we'll see if Adele wants to say anything when she comes back. Um, I'll take a motion to re re review and approve the minutes of uh, February 12th 2019, unlike what the agenda says. I'll move acceptance of the minutes. You weren't even here. <laughs> you can still I can still do it. I can do what I want. <laughs> but it's true, you can even vote if you didn't even attend a meeting. Oh, you can? Yes. yes. Oh, and you can vote yes? Even. Oh, nice. We didn't get a second. Did we? Uh, at least a second. Oh, okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Um, uh, actually, if it fell. Oh, Mary. Okay. Um, so it's actually a fairly light agenda because it's going to be just reporting back on stuff unless Wayne has something on the climate resilience or generation. So that gives us time for a presentation suggested by Elisa um, uh, around a program that did solarize with solar hot water just kind of solar hot water in general. So we're going to introduce Spartan, the Spartan Solar, right? Spartan, I don't know your last name. Giordano. Giordano, okay, Spartan Giordano. He's probably the only Spartan that exists. Mm -hmm. so I don't know last name. Great, mm -hmm. right. your, your parents, like, in love with some TV show or movie or something, or? Uh, no, they just no actually, uh, uh, family name, Spartan, wow. Italian. Okay. Uh, they just messed with it a little bit. Uh -huh. So uh, modernized. Yeah, they uh, creative folks from yep. the world in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't know anybody like that. Barton, you going to talk a little bit about incentives and stuff? There we go. Sure thing. Yep. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to you. So um, just so I can watch my time, uh, how much time uh, um, should I budget? You know, I think I think we've actually got plenty of time. Um, I don't think it's going to take us max to get a half hour to get over our stuff. So actually, don't worry about it. Don't get too long winded on us. But um, all right. Um, but I think I think I don't think I'm going to worry. Just about start it. texting or something to let me know that oh, <laughs> it's time to go to the next slide. Um, so. Uh, my name is Spartan. I uh, started Spartan Solar. We install solar hot water systems uh, um, and uh, service them. I started it in 2014. Been in the solar hot water industry for about 10 years. Uh, originally, getting my feet wet with solar hot water, and not literally, uh, 10, year, uh, 10 or 12 years ago with co-op power um, and. Uh, um, we have uh, a small company, two employees, uh, we employ quite a few different subcontractors for our work and uh, we've made it our mission to reduce our carbon footprint using this technology um, and uh, at any time if you have questions, you know, just interrupt me. Uh, I used to be a classroom teacher so that's not really different. Um, so thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, uh, so, uh, last year we installed probably about uh, 30 systems or so um, throughout the valley um, and uh, serviced quite a lot of other systems. We keep a lot of systems going in our fleet and um, uh, we, we focus on domestic hot water. Uh, while there are other applications for solar hot water, uh, like pool heating and space heating, uh, we enjoy being in the domestic hot water uh, part of things in particular. Just to cover the basics for anyone who doesn't know, uh, we have a couple of panels on the roof, maybe three or four if, or larger families, um, and uh, we have a large tank that serves as a thermal battery 
80, 120 gallons in the basement. Uh, there's a pump uh, shown sort of right about here. Uh, and there's a fluid antifreeze, propylene glycol, non-toxic, that gets circulated to and from the panels. So here it's going up away from the tank cold, gets up to the panels, through the pipes, goes through the panels, gets hot from the sun, comes back down hot, and then hits inside the tank a coil of piping called a heat exchanger, and the heat's traded off and repeat. Uh, in all cases, we need a backup. So um, in what we're showing in this slide is an electric element that would heat the top half of the tank. Heat rises, so the backup is always in the top half of the tank and doesn't touch the bottom half. And so you have sort of this stratification that occurs where it's cold, water comes in the bottom, gets heated up by the solar, or maybe not if the weather's lousy, and then gets finished off on the top half of the tank. Uh, sometimes you have a boiler that heats the top half of the tank, so you have a second heat exchanger. That's what's being shown here. Um, I'll go over a little bit of history uh, about solar hot water throughout this uh, presentation. And uh, one of the things that was missed in the 1980s during the first solar boom uh, was what we call overheat protection and it led to a lot of systems that needed extra maintenance, more frequent change outs of the solar fluid, the glycol. Um, and so uh, the systems that we saw from those, the, that decade of, of, of installations um, tended to go into disrepair in the 1990s and, and throughout uh, the early 2000s. And so when we design a system that has overheat protection, what we're referring to is uh, what does the system do when your tank is at maximum uh, capacity for temperature, which we set ours to be up at 170 degrees, and it'll get there during the summer for sure, not so much during the winter. Um, uh, once in a winter it might hit 170. Um, in any case, what do you do with the extra heat? And uh, the glycol, if it gets overheated, will turn acidic and become sludgy. And if it's not changed out, it will destroy the panels from the inside out, uh, leading to leaks. Uh, so overheat protection is really critical. And uh, we have a couple of different methods that uh, have sort of come to fruition in the last uh, 10 years, which are robust. They're passive, they don't require electricity or any human inter intervention. They don't require an extra heat dump or any special valve. Uh, and so I'll go over one of those and, and we're gonna call it drain back. So uh, in a drain back system, here's where that stick that I don't have would be helpful. I'm not used to having the screen so high up. Uh, so we have a drain back tank and it's positioned below the height of the panels. It's kind of like just a big bubble of piping in the, in the system, in the loop. Uh, and uh, when you fill the system with glycol for the first time, you stop filling it when the fluid gets to this level. And so everything above this line is air, which is really unusual for a piping system. Typically in all of our boilers in our homes, for those who have it, uh, it's going to be 100% filled with fluid. Um, and that's important for those types of systems. Um, and so what this means is that uh, the pump, which is indicated by the circle, the triangle in it, gets fed by the, when it decides to turn on because the controller has said, hey, look, there's some heat to collect and put it in the tank. So the pump gets fed by the reservoir, uh, the drain back tank fluid, and then it pushes it up into the panels, displacing the air. The air now is forced to live in the drain back tank and you're off and running, collecting heat. If anything goes wrong, whether it's uh, uh, a mouse chew through the sensor wire, whether the power goes out, um, uh, if the pump fails, the controller fails, you know, all of these things that could potentially go wrong, it's all okay. Nothing catastrophic can happen because it's all going to mean that the fluid just falls back down into its resting state at the height of this red line. Um, uh, there are a few occasions when we we are unable to install a draining system, but for that we will have another method which works almost as well. And um, if you want to pick my brain about it some other time, I'll be happy to share. 
Uh, in a drain back system, uh, you can locate the drain back tank in the cellar. Uh, so the, in the, off to the left in the upper corner is the drain back tank. It's about 10 gallons. Uh, in this particular case, the pump in red is below it. Uh, it's the same system from the exterior of the house. Uh, they also have solar electric on the main part of the house. Our, our solar hot water panels are off to the side. Whenever we talk about solar hot water, uh, we talk about solar fraction. Uh, how much benefit is it providing? And how much hot water is being offset by the solar hot water system? And so we can expect 70 to 80 percent for pretty much all of our systems. Uh, it's always a black box to us how much hot water a household uses, but we'll use a rule of thumb number of 20 gallons per person per day of hot water. If you think about it, 10 minute shower for most people every day, and maybe two gallons per minute flow on the shower head, there's your 20 gallons per person right there. For coming up with these numbers, we uh, have sophisticated computer models, uh, which when you plug in the weather data, the siting conditions, and the panel brand, and so on and so forth, we're always coming up in the 70 to 80 percent range. Uh, and, um, uh, and that's when we design it appropriately. That's, that's of course, you know, that included. Another big stride forward uh, in pretty much all uh, trades these days is data logging and, and connectivity and solar hot water is no exception. Uh, it's perhaps more critical than many other trades because uh, the solar hot water system is invisible to us if you have a backup going, which is to say if your electric element or your boiler is heating your hot water, that might mask and hide a problem with the solar hot water system. Uh, of course, you could always turn it off, and some really uh, energy efficient folks do shut off their element or boiler for the summer, uh, and that's great. And then you might notice that, hey, I'm not getting hot water, and it's been great weather. All right, something must be wrong with the solar hot water system. The data logger solves that uh, as long as you have the internet connection, and so it'll send us an email alert if anything goes wrong. Uh, here's a, a splash page for a system we installed in Amherst. Um, this particular system, we did a deluxe data logging package, which is above and beyond what we would normally do. And we put in sensors everywhere and, and flow meters and so forth. So we got some actual BTU consumption numbers, which is difficult to acquire. Um, and so we can actually know what the solar fraction for this system is, as opposed to sort of just going by the software and the, and the rules of thumb. So. Uh, the, at, at the time that I took this screenshot, um, which uh, looks like it was April 2017, um, according to the calendar there, we had a solar fraction of 82%. And that represented, I think, uh, a full year of data for this system at that point. Um, and, uh, oh, so, uh, I'm sorry, the lifetime is 81%. Eight, that particular month of April was 82%. And so, uh, according to the that year, they, the, this family of five used 37,000 gallons of hot water. Here's the screenshot uh, for that system of the schematic. Uh, and uh, this probably is, I, I chose a, a particular moment in time when the tank was fully satisfied. So um, on the left, we, uh, or maybe I should say the middle, Here's our solar tank, you have your internal coil uh, right here, and uh, the drain back tank is shown there. Uh, it's a preheat system, so there was an existing heat pump hot water heater, which is now being fed by the solar tank. Uh, and as you can see, the system has maxed out at 170, uh, almost evenly top to bottom. Uh, and, and that's what we like to see. Incentives is for you, Aiden. Oh, a few other people. Are <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, we have a lot of different incentives, and 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 it gets confusing really fast. Unfortunately, um, they're a blessing and a curse. You know, as 
they take a lot of time to explain to everybody and you lose people along the way, there's hoops to jump through, and honestly, if we have consumers who do their due diligence with, you know, okay, I'm not gonna trust my this contractor who's coming into my house, I'm gonna go back and check their a little bit of their information. And all of a sudden, it's a lot of effort and we lose, we lose clients from it. But at the same time, we gain clients too, uh, who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it. Uh, so uh, we have the Clean Energy Center, which provides a generous rebate for each system. Uh, the rebate varies anywhere from the low to mid 2000s up to 4500 uh, for a single family residence. We have tax credits. I'm sure most of you are familiar with those. Um, and so I won't go into that. And then as of the beginning of last year, uh, we have the Department of Energy Resources uh, allocating alternative energy certificates for uh, not just solar hot water, but other technologies like mini splits and uh, pellet boilers uh, and geothermal, a whole bunch of really esoteric technologies like uh, I'm pretty sure the the uh, methane biodigester at Barway gets AECs as well. Um, and so it totals up to be a very large amount of money. Uh, our system costs are between ten and 12000 uh, typically, depending on whether or not we're a two or three panel system. And uh, we're bringing that cost down by 80% um, and averaging in the low 2000s probably for installation. Sorry, does that include the tanks as well? Or just oh, yeah. The yeah, yeah, turnkey system, um, and oftentimes we'll, in talking to clients, we, you know, our basement hydronic systems are, are there's a lot of different variables out there, and people have recirculation loops, or they might have more than one, maybe they have a wood boiler plus a regular boiler, and and we're happy to integrate into all those systems, uh, and and sometimes it costs a little extra, uh, but we, we end up with a really good outcome when we do. Did you say again the cost of the system, the, the general figures? Before incentives, we're 10 to 12,000 averaging. Uh, after incentives, we're a little above two average, um, with probably a range anywhere from 1,000 to uh, 3,500. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little, it, you know, I'll get into it in a moment, but you know, it's like, how come we're not doing more of this? And there are some good reasons, and and they're not really deserved, but they're there and and they're understandable. Well, can you just talk on that for a minute? I think sure. Like we're oh, I'll let you finish, but I think we're really interested in that yeah. user adoption and behavior. Why people aren't? Why aren't you busy? Yeah. Why PV? Why not this? Like sure. This? Right. Um, and and on Chris, the while you're on the incentives page, can you go? Uh, two questions. Uh, the ACs, do you yep. have to verify how much heat you produce? No, not for small systems, which okay. actually, in my opinion, goes up to large systems. I think it's 20 panels or oh, more wow. needs sophisticated data logging. Not dissimilar from what we installed for our client in Amherst, but perhaps even more elaborate than that. Okay, okay, so, so if you have a small enough system, they just assume a certain amount? Yeah, so there's time. a formula, uh, more complex formulas, um, and uh, you get a check up front for a predicted 10 year generation. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, commercial, basically the same? <coughs> but as I suppose, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, they stuff. don't do, they, the DOER doesn't differentiate between commercial and residential. It's, okay. they just look at it by number of panels. How about municipal? Because we don't get, we right. have no ability to get a tax credit. Right, the DOER doesn't care about that either. Um, okay. the, the rebate, has a, a municipal slash nonprofit formula, which gives a extra money to those entities, be, under the assumption there are no tax credits going to those entities. Okay, so that's so the Mass EC gives you a, a boost if you're a if you are a nonprofit or municipal. a municipal entity. Okay. Yeah. Heat won't qualify. Yes. Or do these qualify? residential? Yeah. yeah. So uh, and that's on the next slide. There. <laughs> And hers rating, something that's close to what you do. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Very, actually, it's exactly what you do. 50 or, uh, 50 or under, same as the mini-slit AECs? 
I'm sorry, what? The, is it 50 or under? If uh, hers 50 or under, you get the additional ADC oh, credit? No, the ADCs are different that way. Um, the solar hot water gets ADCs no matter what. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with that you need to have a... Actually, I think what it is, if yes. I recall from talking to our aggregator, is that the um, if you do have a HERS rating of 50 or under, they actually give you a benefit on yes. the ADCs. Yeah, that's how it is with the heat pumps. Mm -hmm. Oh, significant. so you get it anyways above 50, but there's a bonus if yeah. you're below. Oh, yes, that, that is the case, in my understanding. More, so, yeah. I don't know what the formula is, because that's the aggregator's job. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and the, and, the, and the heat pumps, you have to have a, the house has to be like 95 or 99% heat pump, right? Yeah. In that yeah, and so uh, we get the zero interest financing from MassSave, which is great. A lot of our clients take advantage of that. Um, and um, again, to what Aiden does in hers ratings, um, we get a seven point benefit for, which is huge actually, uh, um, for, for using a solar hot water system on a new construction home. Uh, quick snapshot of a spreadsheet. Up I've got it in there, and I'll, I'll come back to the question that you wanted me to skip to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it's coming up in a couple of months. Um, so here's a, a snapshot from one of our spreadsheet uh, proposals. Um, so we lay it all out there very clearly. Um, beginning system cost for this particular three-panel system, uh, 11475 Subtract off all the green line items, and then you're down at 1300 uh, and change for the incentive, uh, after incentive cost. Uh, quick, quick picture of a system we did, five man, family member residents in Buckland. Uh, these, that's the, before the ACs were in effect, so quite possibly they would have had even less of a cost. Sorry, so, sorry. this is for you, Ada. Oh, wait, sorry. Okay. Oh, so close. If you have a tankless water system, how is that? Yeah, sure, that integrates really well. Um, so uh, you've got your your tankless water system, and w whether it's propane or natural gas, whatever, uh, we we need a tank, we need a solar tank, and rather than having the backup in the top half of that tank, there's just nothing. It's just all solar, top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And so then the hot water or preheated water, whether it's 170 or 50, because 50 January 3rd, and it's been a, two weeks of clouds. Uh, so then it comes out and it hits, uh, well, it, it ultimately hits the, the on-demand unit. But actually, in between there, you need a mixing valve because the on-demand units uh, typically have a threshold for how hot the incoming water can be, uh, which, uh, depending on, we always check in with what the manufacturer's specs are, but it's anywhere from 120 to 140, uh, typically. Um, I'd say around 130 usually. So we usually, when, whenever we install these systems, we don't want that 170 at the faucet, so we have an anti scald mixing valve to protect the, the users, the, the people. <clears throat> so, Aiden's question, how can we make this happen? What's, what's, the, what's the logger jam here? <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's no secret that solar PV has stolen the spotlight here. <laughs> Um, and, and deservedly so in a lot of ways. If we had to pick uh, an either or situation, all right, you have to have solar PV or solar electric in all of Massachusetts, which you choose? Well, I think it would be solar electric because we can do this. We cannot do this with solar hot water um, because all of our energy has to be used locally, on site, within a couple days, um, maybe three, uh, if, if you've got some really good conditions in your tank. And, thermal picture so forth. Um, and so we're, we're always installing these two and three panel systems, job to job to job. Sure, once in a while we get a commercial system which might be like eight or 12 panels. And still, you know, we can't get to this sort of, you know, massive keep multiple crews busy for a month type job, which is extremely profitable and easy to manage from a solar company's point of view. And going back in the history, uh, 10 years ago, solar companies existed, and they did both solar hot water and solar PV. 
and most of their business was in hot water because the incentives didn't exist for PV yet. The technology hadn't made this exponential growth in efficiency and development of the product. And so we had companies that were doing both, and that was great. And, and one thing that's really got to be made clear is that they are totally different technologies. You know, rectangles in the sun, that's it they have, that they have in common. <laughs> and, and that's why this slideshow is called Best Rectangle for the Job, because ultimately, we don't have this either or decision to make. We can have both. And the best rectangle for the job for heating your hot water is the solar hot water panel. We produce more energy with a solar hot water panel per square foot by a very long shot by comparison. The trouble is it's all in BTUs. And so it's not flexible. And so we only have this one small piece of the pie <laughs> Sorry. That is domestic hot water. And it's a worthy chunk of the pie. And particularly for, as Aiden can verify, for new construction homes, as we bring down our heat load with super insulation and airtight house construction, now the fixed uh, energy use, which is inflexible uh, for the most part, unless we really have a cultural shift, uh, is domestic hot water. That's going to now become a larger portion of the, sorry, and <laughs> Aiden, what, maybe you even have some numbers uh, off the top of your head, like as we are getting to those super insulated houses, what fraction is is domestic hot water taking out of the energy picture of the house? I don't know. I mean, as, as loads get really low, like 20 kbq uh, for a house, um, hot water stays the same. You're saying, right. I don't know what the fraction is, but you know, people aren't using less hot water. I mean, a little bit. I mean, higher efficiency. Washing dryers, yeah. shower heads, all that stuff. But um, you're absolutely right. Chris? I'm just going to cut in with a small anecdote. Oh, I, I did a bike trip out in Denmark. We started coming across some signs in Solar Village, something. We went to see what it was. We were on an island. And we ran across the world's second largest solar hot water array. It was a oh, football really? field filled with solar hot water. It was an enormous hot water tank, a you know, towering hot water tank behind it. And just around the corner was basically the rest of the solar hot water array, which filled up another football field that was behind the, um, uh, the plant that burned straw that came off the fields on this island because the government no longer wanted them to uh, burn, you know, open burn it. Uh, so they were producing all the hot water for their town. And the little bit that was missed, about 12% that they couldn't cover, um, they were making plans to import pellets from Canada. Huh. Um, to do the rest of it. So it was all, I mean, it was 100% domestic hot water distributed, dis distribution, heating. district heating, common in Denmark. Um, right. But uh, so you can have a field full of <laughs> it's, solar hot water. It's not impossible. Maybe sure. Northampton wants to look at where we would want to put one. <laughs> Village Hill? <laughs> uh -oh. What I don't understand is there's so much focus on the electrify the grid and such because that's how we're going to, you know, the grid's going to be greener and greener. Right. But if you can tie these into forced hot water heating systems, you know, natural gas, it seems like there's a huge efficiency gain there. Space heating, you mean? Yeah, sure. You know, and especially from a consumer's perspective, and cost effectiveness. You're yeah. Saying, you know, yeah. Um, space heating uh, is an option. It does work. Um, uh, the challenge, it, it's a, it's a bit of an expensive challenge uh, because the. The times when you need the heat the most for space heating are the times when there's right. the least sun. Uh, and so, uh, just as a, for example, um, uh, a year ago, we installed a 12 panel system on a super, ins wait, Aiden, that's the one we met on. Uh, Andy Ziegler? That's right, off-grid house. Yes, yeah. So, uh, it, it's funny, I'm out in Beckett in the middle of nowhere. Off-grid, down a dirt road, down a dirt road. And um, I'm installing the system and uh, minding my own business. And then there's a knock on the door, and it's Aiden. <laughs> I'm like, "What are you doing here?" <laughs> oh, that was that was a funny moment. You're in some big copper tank. 
uh, we were installing a 1,200 gallon tank, which uh, uh, was exciting. And we had 12 panels uh, on an outbuilding, uh, underground piping run to the building. And, and the system works great. We, uh, our models, which admittedly were not super in depth because we didn't have an, uh, what I felt like was an accurate heat loss number for the house, but it's a super insulated, double stud wall, quadruple pane windows. Um, and, you know, the whole nine yards, a fairly large house. And um, uh, our models, again, which I wasn't feeling awesome about, but 45% offset for the season. And this is a super insulated home. So, you know, it, we're putting in this very expensive system, which made sense for the client because it's off grid and did not want to burn anything uh, other than wood. And, and so this was a good solution um, for, for him. He also had an air to water heat pump, which uh, the, those particular units he's been fairly disappointed with. It's still too beta, the whole air to water heat pump thing. Um, anyways, uh, it's, it's possible we can make a dent, but for the amount of dollars that it takes to make that dent in a space heating system and the space that it takes up, it's, it's challenging. Uh, I think we, you know, if we were, you know, had a slab where we were integrated into the slab and we used the slab as a tank, mm -hmm. you know, I think we might be able to bring down our costs some uh, and, and keep our, our, you know, our offset as high as that it is. Ultimately, we don't know what the offset is because we didn't do the, uh, we didn't have the, the money in the budget to do like the ultimate data logging system that would keep track of all the BTUs coming and going uh, in the house, you know. So going back to my earlier statement is that we're producing a lot more energy for a solar hot water panel. Here's two panels. If we had 300 watt panels, we need 10 of them to make up the same amount of energy. Uh, the solar electric panels are using only blue light to make their electrons. It turns out that blue, the blue vo wavelength is what it takes energy-wise. Not too strong, it's the Goldilocks thing, not too strong, not too soft, and it knocks the electrons off the atoms and gets them going. Uh, and of course, it, it, you know, we just need to step outside on a sunny day and you can feel all this ener heat energy coming to you, all the infrared light and all the visible light, and that adds up to a heck of a lot more than that little slice of the spectrum. It could change, you know, the technology's getting better all the time. There's definitely some people hard at work uh, figuring out how to capture more than the blue light, um, but we're not there yet. And, and it doesn't look like we're gonna get there in the next 10 years uh, on capturing, you know, 90% of the sunlight's energy, which is what a solar hot water panel can do. Um, so ultimately, uh, the solar hot water system, particularly with the incentives being fair, you know, to both uh, technologies, which currently, um, you know, it's hard to do apples to apples, but uh, they actually are not very balanced uh, per uh, megawatt of incentive, uh, what's the right phrase? Per megawatt of energy generated, the incentives for PV are stronger than solar hot water. Uh, um, on the other hand, if you had to pair uh, solar PV with a battery bank, which would be the equivalent of a tank to us, to solar hot water, then things get way more in favor of, of the incentives for solar hot water. And that's okay, I, you know, I'm not complaining or anything. Um, and the incentives are what they are, for the most part. Uh, from another point of view, from a householder's point of view that wants to drive down greenhouse gas emissions, investing in a solar hot water or investing in a PV system? The money money spent, how much, who's going to drive down the greenhouse gas system? I mean, it really depends on if everybody's using oil. Yeah. Everything, say. Yeah, so it depends on on uh, what Given kind of, of infrastructure is, how it's sort of like sized. You know, mm -hmm. if you have... Uh, a large tank that takes the electrons from your uh, PV system and is able to store them as BTUs in your tank once the sun goes down, then you're doing well. Uh, and But that's not really the way things are panning out. 
most people have panels that are are at a shallow pitch, so they're not really they're designed for summertime collection, right. maximum annual output. Uh, for PV. Right, for solar electric. And the tank size is, if it's uh, using electricity, it could be a heat pump hot water heater, like for, I was about well, to I actually, speak yeah, to. I wasn't thinking of PV for hot water. Oh. I was thinking, if I was going to invest in one of the two systems, just to drive down the greenhouse gas emissions? Mm -hmm. Sure. Am I going to get more bang for my buck by converting my hot water to solar? You're going to do both. It's not an either or. No, 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 no. But, but it seems like there's a balance. There's a, there's a. Totally. I, I, I totally agree. Great. Right. I, I have both in my house. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, uh, but you know, the, the, that first investment that's all I can afford. I, I'm just wondering, would you? It's not an issue because in both cases you can take out a, either a zero interest loan. Or a okay, solar loan. Is, is that, that's a question. I, re, I, re, I, re, I, re, I reject the question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's all a question. It's, you, have it's, a it's, fine, uh, you have a finite amount of roof, roof, roof space. Okay. So ah. if you can't set off 100% of your electric sure. load with the amount of roof space you have doing solar sure. PV, should you give up some of it for solar yes. water? Yes, that that's. Uh, uh, I, I'll or, take that question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because so we're going to collect a lot more energy with the solar hot water roof space than with the solar electric panel roof space. You know, there, there's the sort of representation. So imagine when you put up those two solar hot water panels that you're actually putting up 10 more PV panels. And so now suddenly you gained roof space by being more efficient with your collection. The um, challenge is you're talking to a PV installer or you and you're not you're not talking to someone, a designer, like an architect or a sure. designer, is saying, well, there's an optimum balance here, and I recommend this right. hot water system and this electric you know, service for your home. That's that's what we need. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, uh, we've at Spartan Solar have made it our focus to network with builders and architects, and while it's, it's you know, a big ask for a small company, you know, that's what we are doing. We have a couple builders who, uh, are part of our network who, when they build a new super insulated home, we're there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're installing solar hot water and uh, and then the PV is going, uh, you know, around it because typically we, we kind of have a, more of a restriction on the roof with piping uh, requirements. Isn't that one of the reasons why it's unfortunate that PV companies are True, true. I mean, it's the it's the perennial challenge of, of contracting, which is you you have some goal for your house, uh, like energy efficiency, and you talk to your insulator, you talk to your your uh, mass save weatherization, uh, you talk to uh, the PV guys, the heat pump guy, the HVAC, and you get all of these different numbers, but there's no one person saying, okay, this is you know, your lowest hanging fruit yeah, for you. It's, right here, right here. Well, <laughs> if, if somebody brings in... It has to happen early. It has to happen early. And certainly on a design for a new building that's happening almost categorically now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of information here that I didn't know. And, you know, it just and that, it comes down to finances, right? So a builder is not thinking about incentives. And that's a real part of why this makes sense. 80%. So, true. I'll, I'll pick any house that looks like a good match. I'll pitch it from now on. But I didn't know. All right. Spider, how many how many other companies doing solar hot water are there out there? Um, probably throughout the state, under a dozen. How about in Western uh, Mass? This area? Uh, I know of. Uh, I have probably two or three competitors. Yeah. So it's very there's less. There's and less. and I would easily say that we have the lion's share of the market. Uh, it, it's a, it's, you know, solar PV has siphoned away the talent, you know, and again, I, I, I'm not complaining, it's deserved, it. you know, the, uh, we're making more gains overall that way, but at the same time, we're also, uh, we're, we've lost sight of a technology that, you know, deserves to be, uh, you know, kept on in the mix. Uh, I'm also going to notice the time, just wondering how many more slides you have, or are we kind of getting into the question and answer period? 
Sure, I, uh, you gave me free reign, so I stopped I paying attention to time. So I'm kind of just, I'm just kind of, I'm, 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 it's, not, it's not like you have to stop right now. Sure. Kind of back um, to yeah, I, I can say that we probably have maybe a half a dozen slides left, which, uh, you know, we can move through. Well, I'm going to let you go through them. Right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, heat pump hot water heaters are definitely what are being recommended for our uh, super insulated homes, I think, in a lot, lot of times and for our retrofits where people are uh, trying to go green and trying to get off fossil fuels. Um, uh, I have a couple of things to say that um, I feel like aren't being said enough about them, which ultimately it sums up to if you want to go green, I really believe that solar hot water is the way to go versus, let's say, add on extra PV and then combine with a, a heat pump hot water heater. Um, so heat pump hot water heaters uh, uh, have refrigerant in them, as, of course. And, and as, as someone who has installed air source heat pumps uh, for a couple of years, uh, I know that it's really tough to make sure that there are no leaks. and my question to us as uh, a, a general uh, question for everyone is, are we gonna recapture all the refrigerant when these tanks reach the end of their life? Um, uh, I forget the author's name, but, but uh, Drawdown is a book that is circulating amongst uh, a lot of folks who are looking to go green and find solutions. And the top 100 solutions there in this book, number one is refrigerant management. Out of everything you could possibly do in this world, refrigerant management. Mm -hmm. And so I get really nervous when we're advocating for heat pumps in, in all of these cases. In, in a lot of them, there's no good alternative. Like, it's the best thing. Like, if you have a super insulated house right now, a mini split is the great way to go. If you're offsetting electric resistance baseboard, please install a mini split. Um, but when it comes to the heating domestic hot water, we've got a great alternative, and we don't need to employ the use of more heat pumps, which uh, have some of their own drawbacks, which like for super insulated homes, it's like, are we accounting for where that heat's coming from? Is it coming from another heat source in the house? Are we just simply shifting our load to something else and taxing that, or are we actually making a benefit by drawing it from, let's say, a, a a wood stove that happens to be in the basement that somebody fires up to keep their whole house warm. And then it's like, all right, put the heat pump next to that, that'll work great. Um, so last few slides here are about a program that we are nearing completion on. Uh, a year ago, roughly, we started the, a solarized hot water Western Massachusetts campaign uh, originating from the rebate agency, the Clean Energy Center. Hampshire Council of Governments was the local uh, sponsoring organization um, and uh, it has been a really fantastic program. It's really gotten our Solar Hot Water's name out there. We've got a lot of clients going. I'll speak to that in a moment. Um, I really, uh, just a small criticism, I really wish the folks in Boston didn't think that Western Massachusetts was appropriate for the Solarize campaign in terms of the entire area. <laughs> this is four counties that they thought would work. And so we didn't lower our costs at all, you know, which is the whole goal of a solarized campaign. Like get, get a bunch of installs in a small dense area and, and go with it. Uh, and then you can say, okay, go to house to house to house, you know, submit all your building permits at once. Um, you know, it, it really can help the installer bring down the costs for, the, for, for everyone. So we, we, we came up with a, ever so slightly better than sort of our average cost structure, which I can share with you. Uh, just giving you an idea of, of that we have a lot of variables in play. Um, I spend a long time thinking about all of the different variables that are most frequently coming up for integrating into a domestic hot water system. And each one has a different adder associated with it. Uh, we have base system costs. And you know, this is very different from solar PV, where uh, you have only a handful of variables. You know, is it one story, two stories? What's the roof material? What's the pitch? You know, those things uh, play for us too. But we also have, what's the tank access like into the basement? You know, what's the existing fuel source? What's the backup going to be? Is there a recirculation loop? Um, 
you know, uh, are we, is there a large tank that has to come out that's gonna, you know, we have to spend an extra time getting rid of? All of these things go into it and, and we formulized it, which was a real great thing. I actually, after doing this, this is all I use now. Uh, I, you know, I didn't use, I used to just do it ad hoc. So it's been really working well. Overall, we got, uh, here's some numbers to share with you about the entire project. Um, uh, Hampshire Council of Governments uh, did only a small amount of outreach and we still got some great numbers. Um, we had uh, uh, minimal attendance at our um, solarized meetings, but I think a big part of the reason why it was challenging from this point of view is that, again, how are you going to organize a solarized campaign for four counties, where, with Berkshire being one of them, <laughs> uh, which is huge, biggest county in the state. So, um, you know, the, the numbers here could, I think, have been a lot higher. Uh, but by the same token, I'm really pleased with them nonetheless. Uh, ran a couple other few numbers, so average system costs uh, for, for the systems as part of this uh, program was just over 2,000, and uh, we're offsetting a whole bunch of carbon. Would you say something about the cost of these systems running them? Are you, are you saving money by having the system in place? As well as the short. Back? Yeah, um, I didn't include information on that because it's a very com complicated topic. You know, again, PV has it a lot simpler. Electric bills are, even if you're national grid to ever source, you're paying roughly a similar, you know, 18 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, but, you know, you can go from uh, electric resistance, which if you had a family of three or four, you might pay $1,000 a year for your hot water, uh, maybe even 1200 uh, depending on usage, uh, which remains a black box, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to natural gas, where you might pay uh, 100 or $200 a year for the same family. And so cost structuring uh, payback, you know, we have it in our formulas embedded on our spreadsheets that go out for our proposals, but it gets wicked complicated, which again, hampers our ability to sort of market. You know, it, it's, uh, again, uh, solar PV has, has, has grown exponentially. And one of the great things that happens for that, uh, that market is that every month you get this electric bill that has precision accuracy on it, that nobody's questioning whether or not did you get, you know, uh, a bill for, for $300 or $400. No, it's $329.65 and, uh, if you have PV on your house and you're zeroing that out, uh, boy, isn't that something to talk to your neighbors about? You know, hey, look at this bill, <laughs> negative. <laughs> you know, we, we have nothing that is month after month after month after you're done with the job, giving people that thing to talk about. And you know, I'm, it's just is what it is. You know, there's, there's no, nothing we can do about it, save for, you know, being smart and, and you know, trying to think beyond the, uh, what, what immediately happens. I saw, I saw you had some ground units or remote units, is that? Sure, is yeah, that we've done ground mount. <clears throat> um, we try to stick close to the house because underground the piping has a fair bit of heat loss. Um, it's also uh, proportionally expensive. You know, if you had a field of PV or, or whatever that's some distance from your house, the trenching costs and piers and stuff uh, proportionally go down significantly, but we're only doing, again, a couple few panels, uh, so we try to stick. Right, back. so if you, you, are, you have a roof that's already occupied right. with PV, right? So yeah. you have an opportunity to put units on the ground. Right. It doesn't affect <coughs> pumping pressures and things like that, distribution. Yeah, I mean, we have to take that into account. I mean, typically, it's not, it's not, big, not big of a deal. Um, uh, again, it's more about the heat loss of, than of the underground piping combined with the, the, the added proportional cost. You know, the, um, the, if, you, if you think of, it might need four piers and as a contractor building decks or whatever, you're going to get 300 bucks a pier or something. You know, $1,000 or 
bump on a system that's 11,000 right. is proportionally right. significant. Um, well, or, or an alternate roof, lower roof. Yeah, and, and we definitely we definitely can do <laughs> better than PV in energy collection because we have a larger spectrum to grab. So uh, rules of thumb in the industry are that you need 80% uh, solar access or better to make solar PV right. uh, shine. Uh, we're go down as low as 70% um, and still do pretty well. Uh, off angle stuff like facing due east or due west is about the same as PV uh, because that has less to do with the sunlight and, and more to do with with the angles. But um, the uh, east and west systems work really well as, as well. You just add an extra panel to compensate. Uh, for the off angle and, and you rebound nearly back to where you were with what you might have had with a south facing system and um, another option for us which has worked out quite a few times now is an awning mount um, yeah that's what I think and, you know each house and site is different and right. awnings they don't work too often but when they do it's really cool uh, one of my favorite ones to do is and you've, you've all seen those sort of prefab houses where you know the, the shutters the fake shutters are on the front and then you go around side and and maybe there's one window and no shutters and it's all vi like one big wall of vinyl siding uh, and and if that's a south facing wall it's like all right this is good we can do this <laughs> um, uh, whereas pv it's just not enough space to sort of make that worthwhile um, so you speak to the labor market for a minute? Maybe, Tim, you have input put on that. I know, like, for uh, mini split installers, there's a big shortage in here. And there's like installers have a hard time finding people skilled enough to install them. Mm -hmm. um, assuming there's like a growth in, in your sector, is there, because it hasn't been growing in the last 10 years, is there, do you feel like there's a shortage? Like, if you wanted to hire Yeah, yeah. I mean, my opinion uh, of that is that uh, if I want to hire on another person, which I would if the incentives are promised to continue uh, beyond the current expirations, uh, I would definitely hire another person this year. I'm under no illusion that I'm going to get somebody who knows anything about the intricacy of solar hot water installation. Mm -hmm. But that being said, there's a lot of skills that cross over. We could get somebody who's a boiler tech, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, you know, going back to what I said earlier, it's rectangles in the sun, and like that's the only thing that's common between solar and PV. We have more in common with working on boilers than with solar electric uh, with the, all of the piping we do uh, and management of BTUs and sensors and so forth. So that would be a decent crossover field to grab somebody. Um, I like carpenters and farmers as well. Um, I, both of my employees are former farmers so and they are really handy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, we just have to train up and it would take a year. Uh, but I'm not worried about that. It's something we can handle. I wanted to just add something in kind of based on that. So I do have a solar hot water system that has not been working for three, four years mm -hmm. or so. And one reason it still isn't working is that I could not find someone who would buy it. I work out of How hard did you look? I, I looked for, I mean, I, would, I called everybody I knew, went to the solar, solar store, um, there, I was, I was, leads I were, was giving never called me back. John and Claire, three, or, yeah, or they, was they, it? They, they, could, they could not give me someone. What yeah, about, they, and then Brandon Turner didn't come out. Yeah, a, a name was mentioned, I won't say who it was, and I tried contacting them multiple times, and they never got back to me. Uh, so, yeah. uh, actually, Spartan's coming out to my house tomorrow. But also I heard was other people who say, I don't work on someone else's systems. So that was another comment I heard from some yeah. uh, some installers. Yeah. Uh, they said, "Yeah, we put them in, but we don't work on anybody else's system." So, just labor-wise, yep. there's a dark it's an issue. People to work on older systems out there. Uh, and it's nice to have at least one company that does. Yeah, yeah we're we're not shy about working on a huge variety of systems. Uh, and um, I probably shouldn't have said this before we come up with a contract. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the so this isn't this isn't a new situation for solar hot water. Uh, going back to what I said at the beginning, 
uh, with the systems from the 1980s. They, they required a fair bit of maintenance, those systems. And there are, on the other hand, still systems from the 1980s that are in our fleet that are running. And they're cranking away. You know, 35-year-old panels, no problem. Uh, so we look at those systems and well, what did these people do? How did this go right? Um, and and we, we try to, very hard, to make sure that we are recapitulating some of those ideas and combining some of the newer ideas that we see that are very robust. And, and there's a reason why I included the drain back design in there. It's a zero pressure system, nominally speaking. So it doesn't really want to leak, and leaks are the number one cause of failure. Um, and there's a, a subtraction of parts that can fail when you do a drain back system. Uh, there's things called expansion tanks, which can fail. Check valves can fail. Those two items are eliminated from a drain back system. You don't need either one of them. Uh, you're really left with only one moving component, which is the pump. And the pumps that are made by the leading brands are uh, absolute workhorses. Uh, we see those same pumps uh, running dry with no fluid through them for uh, months at a time. And you know, you refill the system after you fix the leaks and away they go. It's unbelievable what abuse these pumps can take. So the one thing that might fail seems to be uh, built with uh, good old American robustness. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, it leaves us with, with very few maintenance items. And, uh, you know, just to be fair, uh, Chris, Chris's system, which while we haven't seen it, we're familiar with the design. Um, and w there are some pitfalls from that particular design, from that particular company that we are aware of. Um, and we, we don't want to go down that road again. Uh, it's the reason why all of our joinery is soldered. Uh, we know that soldered fittings last for a hundred years, if we look back at older homes. And in the solar industry, we know that they can last for at least 40 years, um, which is about the age of the oldest solar hot water systems. And uh, we've seen some of the new piping systems uh, used and fail uh, prematurely because they either rely on O-rings or uh, complicated fittings to make a seal from joint to joint. And, and we avoid it because we, we are well aware that, that in 10, 15 years time, who knows what the incentives will be. Maybe there will be, like it from 1985 on, no incentives. Uh, you know, for show and tell, uh, you know, one of the other locations that uh, is an issue, which has nothing to do with the system function, is the roof penetration for the pipe. Uh, which, of course, if that that's a, a rainwater consideration. And so for all of our roof penetrations, we use custom-built copper flashing where we have a soldered uh, slip coupling, is what it's called, that is designed with extreme accuracy so that if a pipe goes through it, uh, there's no chance for rainwater leakage. And this will outlast the roof because it's made of copper. And so, um, you know, we don't have an EPDM roof boot that could crack and fail, uh, at least when we're on an asphalt roof. With metal roofs are a little different. We, for metal roofs, we, we, have, we go to silicone roof boots, which um, silicone is better than EPDM, and it has a higher temperature rating. Um, and so we're pretty confident that being silicone, it will also last as long as the roof. So, you know, it's, it's just the, the nature of, of what we work, we deal with. So I think it's probably good timing. Uh, Martin, anybody, anybody have last questions? We'll let you get your, we'll let you get your um, 
Would you, you consider a smaller, more intensive SolarEyes program in the future? Like, have you learned enough where you could take that model and, and oh, yeah. sit in on like uh, Northampton Amherst? We are totally geared for it. We we um, uh, if if when we started our business uh, four or five years ago, uh, it was like, all right, we can do one system maybe every other week, <laughs> and and. Um, the other week, the other week we did two installs in in Williamsburg. I, I don't know if Louis, you were inspected them. Uh, we finished both of those installs in one week, and and we had time to spare. Uh, so, uh, could could a solarized program yield so many installs that were were swamped and and hit a breaking point? It's a risky run when you do a solarized program, but we're up to the task. Mm -hmm. Question. What about integrating with the uh, like gas-fired uh, electric generating systems? I mean, they basically heat water and process it through a gen through a steam you know turbine steam turbine generator. And if you're adding heat to the mix, um, I don't know if the, t the temperatures are pretty high. Right. Yeah. So um, the a solar hot water system has some fear that uh, is using what in the industry is called the one sun, uh, where, where you're not trying to magnify rays right, right. and collect multiple rays, has a theoretical maximum as to how much heat you can get out of a one sun situation. And ultimately, you're, you're capping out under 200 degrees. And so... So they're starting to cycle it about. So if you're, if you're doing some sort of, of, of process, cogeneration type heating, we just can't get hot enough. There's plenty of energy there, but it's just, it's not concentrated enough. Um, Smith has Smith has a small co-jet. Right. He has a small jet. Right. Small co-jet. Oh. Yeah, and so you look at your return temperature, because that's where you can make your improvement. Right. And um, for home boilers, which are most familiar to me, uh, I don't know too much about co-jet plants. But your return temperature uh, depends on what your emitters are. If your emitter is a baseboard radiator, your, your return temperature might be 140 to 160 uh, coming back, which during the winter, we don't get that hot very often uh, with a typical <coughs> installation. Um, now, on the other hand, if you had a radiant floor, which is essentially a requirement uh, if you're going to try to do space heating solar hot water, then your return temperature could be as low as even 80. Uh, and now you can really make an impact. So I'll also mention that um, where I'm looking at uh, the domestic hot water boilers at the high school need to be replaced. And um, uh, we're looking, uh, and, and, and it's way oversized now um, uh, because the use of hot water is going way down in high schools. Anyhow, the short of it is, we looked at air source heat pumps. Um, the electric upgrade made them uh, needed, made them too cost prohibitive. So we're now looking at solar hot water, uh, with the, the boiler being uh, one of the boilers being a backup. Right. Uh, so that we basically in the summertime we probably can turn keep that boiler turned off. In the wintertime, the boiler is running anyhow. Um, so you know, then we don't need that big of a system. So we're looking at that a little bit. And actually, yeah. going to help us start to look at it. Yeah. I haven't had the time to right. dig at the numbers yet. Um, my off-the-cuff thoughts were that um, if a laudable goal uh, is to shut down the boilers yes. uh, for the summer, um, which would be probably not okay to do because if you would, if on the off chance there the solar hot water hasn't provided enough heat during whenever that boiler is off, you're going to have some pretty unhappy people. Um, well, we'll, we'll if, with the boiler off. Maybe it would work out, but but I'm being conservative. No, I think the boiler, yeah, I think we'll, we'll talk about it. The, the idea yeah. is that the boiler would be a backup and it would be off unless it needs to contribute. Unless it needs to if it's off. a cold start boiler, it could be off. Yeah. I don't know if they are. No. I believe they are. Oh, okay. So then, then I mean, that would work out okay? I mean, they are turned off every summer. So. Right. Right. Well, now they are because you have direct fired hot water. Right. So y your boilers can be shut down. Yeah. But my guess is they are probably not cold start right. boilers, being that they're large. 
Okay. But I don't. It starts to stretch my knowledge. Okay. Yeah. And there are. I would. There are, there are very large hot water tanks up there. I would suggest that if that for the backup to if we're not able to move to electricity in some form, which it sounds like we're not, then have one direct fire tank be the backup, and we would. Uh, use the volume of that tank for solar as well, and we would have a solar tank as well. And then the solar could shut down the, just by temperature wise, and it would be automatic and passive, shut down the direct fire unit um, because it's integrated to it. And then, and, but at the same time, if, if the solar, you know, last August was particularly rainy and, uh, for, our, for our summers and, and and so if that type of scenario where a bunch of people came in and wanted hot water, no problem. That, that would be ready to fire up and it would be firing up without having to have like a big boiler fire up. Okay. We'll, but we'll, yeah. I'm just mentioning that we're looking at it. Possibly have solar out water on the high school. Okay, thank you, Spartan. Thank you for having me. Um, talk your ears off. Thanks for education. I'll, I'll leave some business cards up here. It's probably I don't know. I mean, people. It <laughs> we did get warm, so. <laughs> yeah, we did. And then some. Yeah, and then some, yes. Right. Well, Actually, we, Chris, okay. since I'll be seeing you tomorrow, just bring back whatever is. Yeah, I think it was good back to me. Sure. But what we didn't get was waiting. Right. So, we're waiting. private resiliency and regeneration plan. Uh, I guess we will table that. Um, that's kind of a standing thing on our, our agenda, um, just in case. Um, voting on the IECC uh, 2021. I don't know, Bill, Elisa, do you want to report back? I, I will defer to Elisa. Okay. She walked point on this. And then I'll, I'll, yeah. call, I'll go from the city's point of view. Thank you. Uh, so we, uh, we just a status report. Bye, yes. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. We put through a uh, um, new order to the city council to uh, pay the membership dues to the ICC, one hundred thirty-five dollars, um, and that is being taken care of. So that went through. The city council will have four votes, um, and we're going to work in the coming months. And we have a bunch of advisors, including Chris, um, but we're also working with. Called the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission. Area Planning Commission. Commission that has become kind of the gurus in Massachusetts of how to, how municipalities can participate in the process, helping us. Um, so in the next few months, we're going to come up with a process by which we figure out how the council will either designate four people to vote, or if we have to come back to the council. The, the big issue is is that we have. They publish the ballot two weeks before you actually have to vote. So it's complicated for the council because of open meeting law. We can't come back to the council necessarily within that time frame, get all the council members to agree to what we're voting on, and then on time be able to get back to, to do our votes. So we're trying to figure out if we can just designate four people who make the decisions um, based on recommendations from the MCA and Chris um, so that's that's kind of in the works, but that you know we're moving forward. So someone is um, is going to be sending me a webinar slides. I think things webinar slides that are showing the proposals, the code change proposals that are gone that have gone in this year that people are hoping to get passed. Now that doesn't mean they don't have them yet, though. No, they're they're there. They're, the ones you don't have the what you're going to vote on because they might be modified. Oh, so it's all the proposals that have been submitted, but they might not make it to the ballot, all of those. They said they well, have 500 then, proposals. Right. But you don't have to look at all 500 of them. Right. Right. You're only going to look at the ones that, you, you know, the most important ones for energy efficiency. Um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that you might be able to get an early look at the original proposal. Mm -hmm. What you're going to vote on is going to be different, probably, because it's, there very well might be modifications as it goes through the, you know, the, the, the process of, of considering it. But if that's helpful, um, um, I think I'm going to get. I think I'm getting a download of them basically uh, to look at them. Um, you know, the, the, the tricky part is it's kind of unprecedented because essentially you have a legislative body that's delegating 
legislative authority to four people um, and you have to have consensus and agreement in some way. I mean, with the department, it's much different, but a lot more flexible, but as Elisa laid out, not only that we have open meeting law structure, and then plus we also have to sign off in, by majority vote, which isn't even designated whether it's a super majority or a simple majority vote from the council. So I think, I mean, we're, this is new territory. Yeah. And I don't even think the ethics board is going to be particularly helpful with us on this. So we're going to have to come up with our own and hope it passes muster in the end. So. Okay. Boston City Council is doing it too. <laughs> is it? Yeah. yeah, they get paid $130,000 a piece in bad. So I <laughs> <laughs> plenty of time to figure that out. But that's actually good to know. Although you do know that Boston's uh, charter predates the state's constitution and they do not subscribe to the same rules that the rest of us have. Oh, okay. yeah, for anything. Yeah, <laughs> for anything. Particularly the Dover Amendment, for instance. But yeah. Okay. So they, they're special, as we all know, and they continue to tell us they're special. <laughs> but they may give us some precedent guidance in any event, so we'll see. Great. Okay. okay, thanks. From the city's point of view, um, uh, I'm helping um, the mayor's office, uh, the health departments, and the fire departments are all going to sign up as government members. So that would be 12 more um, votes. Um, so not the planning department, I thought they were... Oh, the planning, actually, planning department, that's, that's old news. They already signed They already signed, yes, they're already. <laughs> so we okay. have five entities, five departments, essentially, that are... Uh, six. Because Louis' department, too. Yeah. Right. Wow. We're a massive voting block. Totally. Yeah, thank you, Adele. Right. 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 That's a 24 yeah. times increase over last year, last time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know the 2018 ICC code was voted on on Monday or last Friday, surprisingly, and they adopted it. BBRS adopted it to go in effect oh, okay. January 1. Yeah. Okay. I thought with the concurrence, is this the concurrency or are they, are they is it hard and fast January Yeah, one? that's what Aaron said. Reported by Darren Port, who's the energy code guy for NEAT. Yeah, he presented And then, yeah, and then they don't, I, stretch code is in currently, the stretch code is like the same. Yeah, yeah, they, so everything's saying no same. No differentiation for stretch yeah. code. Uh, maybe an EV uh, red meat component, that's going to show up probably in the mass amendments, I think, which hasn't been released. Um, and then I guess there's bigger changes for commercial, which I don't keep track of. Percent. I think they just make a percentage, they, they tweak the percentage. But hopefully the stretch code will get a little bit, differentiate itself from the base code more. I mean, the last time it got a lot closer, it, was, it wasn't a ton of difference. You know, I, I mean, just just in the herd, the, the idea that, that you you, the stretch code community only required that you get a HERS rating, but the HERS rating for the whole state was was the same the mandatory. Yeah. It looks like that's not going to change, unfortunately. Well, that's actually one of the reasons why to push for the most energy efficiency improvement you can in the IECC. Is that it puts more pressure to put the stretch code on. Okay. Um, ordinance relative to large scale ground mounted solar arrays um, uh, that was requested at the last meeting to be put back on the agenda just for status. I don't know if anything has changed on that. The only thing that I know is that Carolyn Mish was tasked with um, looking into a number of issues, and I think she's working on that. And the public shade tree committee. Um, is trying to actually craft language for a new uh, order. So I don't know where they are with that either, though, but that's the last thing. Actually, Rich is here. Yeah, Rich, Rich is here. Do I don't, uh, Carolyn is actually working on language, and she's actually trying to get uh, Alan Seawald's take on the new language before she does it all to make sure that it's... And is she doing that with input, like I understood yes, from... Yes, she, yeah, she met with the, the, Yeah, she met with uh, the Lombard Top Four. Okay. Should we keep it on the agenda for status? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Probably. Yes. Yeah. Thank sure. You. Thought so. Great. Um, and that's it. I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Second.
Bill, you're good. You can jump around that way. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.